This show was sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Without a healthy mind, being happy is hard. Visit betterhelp.com super and see if online therapy is for you. Hey, brother! Okay, guys, so for whatever reason, lately we have found ourselves deep back down the rabbit hole that is Fantastic Beast, just trying to figure out what the heck is going on. <laughs> Because for quite some time, it has felt like the Crimes of Grindelwald movie is a little bit of a mess, throwing some wrenches into things, making things not make sense, and isn't maybe the best standalone movie? Excepting, of course, for any scene with Newt and Tina in it together. They are adorable, and I love them. Salamanders. Best scene of that movie. But at this point, I am calling my shot with our predictions that one, Credence is somehow descendant of Salazar Slytherin because he can speak parcel tongue by way of speaking to Nagini. I also think the baby that Credence was switched with at sea, the real Corvus Lestrange, is actually Albus's half brother and in fact, the very phoenix we see at the end of the movie. Get it? Wings from the water. It's a phoenix. He drowned in the water. Phoenix has come back to life. It all makes sense. Out my ears. But we have full videos covering both of those topics if you want to check them out. The thing I've been really getting stuck on lately is just how all of these pieces are going to fit together. Why were both Corvus and Credence being sent to specifically America? Why were we given so much backstory on the founding of Ilvermorny along with the release of the Fantastic Beast movies when only the first movie seems to be taking place in America? And why for some reason is the Lestrange family suddenly so important to everything? Today, we tackle it all. Hey, brother! Guys, before we dive on in, we need to give a huge thank you to today's sponsors, HelloTushy.com and Candid. Let me ask you this, you guys. Why is it okay to only use toilet paper when you go to the bathroom? Because I assure you, if you found yourself in that situation anywhere else on your body, you would be sure to wash it off. Let me just tell you, as a parent of three children and two one-year-old twin boys, this is, this is very true. I know, I know, it's a great point. But honestly, having a bidet really is the superior way to go. Once I attached one of these to the toilet in my house, it went from restroom to a best room. Oh, <laughs> nailed it. Legitimately though, it's one of those products that like once you've tried, you can't go back. And I'll admit, when I heard about them, I was skeptical. I mean, I thought it sounded like a good idea, but I'm not great at installing things. I didn't want to have to call a plumber, an electrician, but great news, you don't have to do any of that. Installation is super easy. You can have that thing up and running in under 10 minutes without additional professional help help from anyone. Start washing with a Hello Tushy bidet for a better clean. And you can get 10% off your order plus free shipping when you go to hellotushy.com slash super. Again, that is 10% off your order plus free shipping when you go to hellotushy.com slash super. And if you do get one, make sure you take a picture and tag at Hello Tushy and us on Instagram. And we also like to give a huge thank you to today's other sponsor, Candid. The older I get, the more I've come to understand the importance of specialists in specific fields. For car breaks down, call a mechanic. For pipe breaks, call a plumber. If you're gonna straighten your teeth, you just can't do it yourself. You need to call the pros and that is where Candid comes in. Candid makes invisible, comfortable, and removable aligners that straighten your teeth fast. And what sets Candid apart from other aligner companies is that they only work with licensed orthodontists, people who specialize in straightening your teeth. And with Candid, you'll work with the same orthodontist who created your original plan from start to finish. And you don't even need to physically go to a doctor's office. The entire treatment can be done remotely. Although there are Candid studios you can go to in person if you want. The average Candid treatment lasts just six months, but you'll start seeing results way before then, and it costs thousands less than traditional braces. Candid can help you get the straighter, brighter smile you've always wanted, and you can get $75 off your Candid starter kit when you get started from home today. Or again, you can book an appointment at a Candid studio near you. Go to candidco.com slash SCB and use promo code SCB. That's candidco.com slash SCB with promo code SCB to get $75 off your Candid starter kit today. Again, candidco.com slash SCB, promo code SCB. Links for everything are in the description down below. Okay, so for starters, let's talk about the Lestrange family because unlike many of the other players that we saw in the Harry Potter books, they're really not actually that big a deal. The last name is indeed very prevalent and important, but that's mostly down to Bellatrix Lestrange and well, I'm sure you remember her <laughs> and her death because you know, it was awesome. Not my daughter. You. The point is, you know about the family because of Bellatrix, but she's not actually a Lestrange. She just marries in. She's a black. But as we enter into the Fantastic Beast story, it becomes very clear that the Lestranges have played a pretty significant role in wizarding history. Which I guess makes sense when you consider Grindelwald's mission is to rise above all the non-magical communities and have wizards take their place as the superior race. And at least based on Bellatrix, that totally seems to be like the Lestranges 
thing. And the idea of that divide though is being illustrated in basically every corner of the Fantastic Beast movies so far. You have characters like Mary Lou Barebone showcasing how the non-magical people feel about magical people in a very negative way. But then on the flip side, you have Jacob, who is the exact opposite side of that coin, a non-magical person who is enamored with everything to do with the wizarding world. Then of course, we're also seeing the statute of secrecy being a huge topic among several wizarding governments with extensive steps being taken to make sure that wizards and magic are not exposed to the outside world. Which let me just say, they really luck out Newt has a Thunderbird and invented a concoction for making people forget unpleasant things with his swooping evil, which is promptly just forgotten about in the second movie for some reason. And then you have the Lestrange family, the living, breathing example of the worst kind of blood purists imaginable. Not only do they see magical people as superior to non-magical people, they also don't really consider daughters who can't carry on the family name worth very much at all. They won't even put their face on the family tree. But then even if you are a magical male member of the family, your dating pool is very limited because you can only marry other pure-blooded families. They are the worst. But I'm talking about them today because on my most recent pass of Crimes of Grindelwald, something really caught my eye, and that is the very limited nature of their family tree. I mean, it's a fairly impressive little magical artifact, but it only actually goes back four generations to Corvus Lestrange the first and his brother, Cyril Lestrange. Which interestingly, thus far, the Fantastic Beast movies had only been dealing with the Corvus side of the tree, which is odd to me because we know that side of the tree dies out with Corvus Lestrange the fourth and Leda, because we see them both die. Which is just interesting to me because we mostly know about the family due to Bellatrix, but she actually would have had to marry in from the other side of the tree. But whatever, that's not the point. The point is someone had to give birth to Corvus and Cyril. Like the tree must go further back right? Or else are these two somehow the first of the Lestrange family line? Like how, how would that work? I smell something being hidden y'all, I smells it. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, did anything significant happen in the wizarding world just before the start of this family tree? And conveniently, thanks to the tree, we know when the tree starts, which was in 1729 when Corvus Lestrange, first of his name, was born. So we're looking for something just a little bit before then. And great news, there is a really obvious historical wizarding event that we can point to, and that is the founding of Ilvermorny in 1627 by a woman named Isolt Sire. Not only does this fall exactly into the time frame we're looking for, but all the information about Assault and the founding of Ilvermorny was launched with the release of the first Fantastic Beasts movie. So it feels like it has to be pretty important and tied into everything else. And Assault herself feels like she has to be the key because she is a fascinating figure in the adults of wizarding history. I mean, not only is she descended from Salazar Slytherin himself on her mother's side, but also from the famous Animagus Morrigan who could turn into a crow on her father's side. As I said, there's actually an entire article over on the Wizarding World archives where you can read about her and the founding of Ilvermorny, and I highly recommend you do that, or you can just, you know, check out this video right here. But as we're talking about family trees, let's look at hers, because we actually get a lot of information about it. We know she marries a muggle man, James Stewart, and subsequently they adopt two wizarding boys, Chadwick and Webster Boot. Then they also give birth to twin daughters, Rianoch and Martha. Rianoch is a witch, but Martha ends up being a squib. And oddly, that is where her family tree seems to end. Well, sort of. Chadwick and Webster do go on to get married and have children, so her family does continue to grow, but as they're adopted, they don't further the bloodline. Which again is fairly relevant because it's the Gaunt slash Slytherin line, so any further descendants of the Salt herself end up being heirs of Slytherin. On that actual note, we know their daughter Rianoch chooses to specifically not have children, so she doesn't further that line. But then there's Martha. Here's what the article says about her. Deeply loved though Martha was by her parents and adoptive brothers, it was painful for her to grow up at Ilvermorny when she was unable to perform magic. She eventually married the non-magical brother of a friend from the Pockumtuck tribe and lived henceforth as a nomage. And that line right there, tucked 80% of the way through this article, I think might be the American key to understanding the origin of the pure-blooded French 
Lestrange family. Because first of all, it does not say that Martha did not have children. That's important, but more on that in a second. Because second of all, how weird is the wording of that second sentence? She eventually married the non-magical brother of a friend from the Pakumtuk tribe and lived henceforth as a nomad. Like at first, I just thought this was a poorly constructed sentence, but upon further consideration, I feel pretty positive it's a clue. Because like, why would you write it as the non-magical brother of a friend? Like, why wouldn't you just say a non-magical member of the Pakumtuk tribe? It'd be like saying last week I hung out with my cousin's brother. That's also your cousin. It's just a very redundant sentence, which includes a very unnecessary detail, which to me can only mean it is a necessary detail. The reason it's important is that we know for sure that Martha grew up at Ilvermorny and found it a very painful experience because she couldn't do magic. So it's likely that her friend is a student of the school and therefore also magical, unlike her brother who Martha marries. And of course we can't say for certain here, but it seems likely enough to me that if her friend is magical, then her whole family is magical minus the brother, which would mean the brother, Martha, Martha's eventual husband is also a squib. So we'd have two squibs who find it painful to grow up in the magical world. They get married and then decide to leave their families and go live with the nomages. They choose to no longer be close with their families and go off and live on their own. Ah, uh, what is the what is the word for that when people do that? Um, um, Estrange, right, right. They estrange themselves. They are the estranged, or dare I say the estranged. Do you see what I'm getting at? And you might be wondering like, well, yeah, but like why would they choose a new name if they've already got names? Well, here's the thing. Indigenous Americans at the time wouldn't have had traditional surnames or last names. But if these two are deciding to estrange themselves from their families and go live amongst the nomads, then they need to adopt their customs and choose a new last name. And sure, they could just stick with Stuart, but if you're estranging yourself from your family, feels like a pretty good time to just start fresh. And since they are estranged and we are looking for the start of the Lestrange family, I feel pretty good about it. But so then if we go back to the Lestrange family tree, you might be wondering, well, then why doesn't it start with Martha and her husband? Why does it start with Corvus and Cyril? Well, don't forget, Martha and her husband are both squibs, which to me means they probably have a good chance to produce a magical child. But I think if they did, we'd know about it. I think it's more likely that they did have children, but that they were non-magical and that that trend continued for about a century before Corvus and Cyril were born and brought the family back to the wizarding world. So if you're keeping up, what's happening in this scenario is that the gaunt line basically goes extinct in America because Martha is a squib, but then secretly re-emerges about a hundred years later as the Lestranges. This also actually helps explain the origin of the name Corvus itself and why the Lestrange family crest includes a raven. Basically, as soon as a new magical member of the family was born, they chose to name him after one of the most famous magical ancestors they had. Morrigan, who could turn into a crow. Uh, but wait, why is it a raven if she could turn into a crow? Aren't those uh, different things? Actually, no. I just learned this, but listen to this. Corvus is a widely distributed genus of medium-sized to large birds in the family Corvidae. The genus includes species commonly known as crows, ravens, and rooks. There is no consistent distinction between crows and ravens, and these appellations have been assigned to different species chiefly on the basis of their size, crows generally being smaller than ravens. That right there explains that the Lestrange family crest is not a raven, it's a crow, which is also a raven, but that they chose it because of their ancestor, Morrigan. And here's where it gets crazy. If that's true, it also means that the entire Lestrange family are actually also heirs of Slytherin via Isolt Sire. But wait, then shouldn't that mean they can speak to snakes? But surprisingly, no. The Pottermore article specifically states that it was Ryanok who was rumored to have inherited that trait, and that is part of the reason she didn't want to have kids. Martha, on the other hand, it seems didn't have the trait to begin with, and it seems neither do any of her descendants. But still, that does leave us with the question of how did a family started by two squibs in America become pure blood maniacs 
in France. Well, my guess is that the first Corvus Lestrange moves the family back to Europe, at least his side of the family, and specifically to France. In fact, he would have been in his mid 30s during the French Indian War in America, so I feel like there would have been a lot of opportunity there. A lot of the fighting did take place in the Massachusetts region of the country, and indigenous people fought on both sides of the war. But the French in particular relied on indigenous people because they were so vastly outnumbered by the Americans. So maybe the Lestranges fought on that side of the war and then just went back to France afterwards. And at this point, it's a little bit of guesswork, but I can easily see why if a family was initially estranged for it being non-magical, why they might then adopt some pure blood mania after re-entering the world. Like you're in a new country, no one knows your history to contradict you, and you just start saying, never marry a non-magical person. Like, never risk losing the magical part of the bloodline again. But then also, if the serial side of the tree remained back in America, it could offer us an answer as to who the potential intended receiver of baby Corvus was. Because don't forget, even though Credence and Corvus were swapped at sea, nobody knows that. And as far as anyone else is concerned, Corvus was successfully delivered to a Mary Lou Barebone as intended. Maybe another Lestrange family member was supposed to come adopt him from her, or who knows, maybe Mary Lou Barebone herself is a squib and was estranged from the family. That would certainly explain her obvious knowledge of the wizarding world and why she hates them so much. Like she looked like the, the logo has someone breaking a wand. Like that's pretty insider information as to how they work. But the real glory of all this and what I kind of love is that if this is true and all of the Lestranges are in fact heirs of Slytherin, then Voldemort is way less special than he thinks as the lone heir of Slytherin. He's just the only one who can talk to snakes. <laughs> but it also super ties into Voldemort's hypocrisy. Like he's a half-blood who's promoting pure blood supremacy. This would mean the Lestranges were started by two squibs and are also promoting pure blood supremacy. Like. They're all just bonkers. But Ben, my question for you and everyone else is, what do you think? Is it possible? Did the estranged Martha Stewart start a family that became the Lestranges? Let me know your thoughts in the towel section down below. But guys, thanks so much as always for watching today's video. Don't forget to leave a like on it if you haven't already and subscribe so you don't miss any future Harry Potter action from us. If you want to find out how Credence is also the heir of Slytherin, you can check out this video right here. But otherwise, Ben, until next time, I will see you in the life.